Let's open up in a word of prayer, and we'll get started here in Matthew 24 as we continue our study through this amazing gospel of Matthew. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. We pray that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Lord, we ask that you be glorified in all that is said and done, that your people would be edified, and that we would have ears to hear and just feet to move, hands to reach out. May we just be your body working in this world to bring glory and honor to Jesus. And Lord, we ask that um, your Holy Spirit would give us ears to hear uh, what you're saying to us through your word. Your word is living, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So may you pierce our hearts with your truth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So today we come to the great prophetical chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. It's one of the greatest prophetical chapters in all the Bible, Matthew 24, uh, also known as the Olivet Discourse, chapters 24 and 25. Uh, Jesus just finished blasting the religious leaders on the Temple Mount. We saw that throughout chapter 23. He is rebuking uh, saying to the scribes, Pharisees, calling them hypocrites, you know, many times. He pronounces, woe over you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. And as he finishes his pronouncements of woes and judgments against those religious leaders, he begins lamenting over Jerusalem and all her people. Look at the end of chapter 23, verse 37. It says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is right after he's finished rebuking these guys. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing I mean, that was his desire. He just wanted to gather the people to him. He wanted to protect them. He wanted to bless them. He wanted them to see that he is their Messiah, but they were not willing. Verse 38, see, your house is left to you desolate. In other words, Jesus is announcing the impending doom and destruction upon Jerusalem and specifically her glorious temple and her surrounding buildings, and most importantly, what would happen to the Jewish people when this takes place. He then announces to the multitudes there in verse 39, For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is when he comes back at his second coming. He goes, you guys won't see me again until I return in power and great glory. He'll speak more of this later on in this chapter and also in chapter 26. But he's going to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to establish his kingdom here on earth. He is going to set up his kingdom, rule and reign from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. It's the millennial reign of Christ. He, he does that only after the great tribulation. That seven-year period when, when God pours out his wrath, his judgment upon this sinful world. So as we come into chapter 24, he picks up, um, we, we pick up with Jesus leaving the Temple Mount with his disciples. They drop down the Kidron Valley. They go up to the side of the Mount of Olives, and then they will sit there, and he will instruct them. But on the way there, they're going to ask him a few questions, and they just ask the questions like it's one event. Jesus will break this down throughout chapter 24 and show us that it's not just one event that happened in 70 AD, but these are things for the future, for our future as well. He's going to tell them what's going to happen to Israel when the Romans come, how they're going to destroy the temple, but he's also going to talk about when he returns at his second coming. Two very distinct things. The Jews don't realize that at this point. His disciples don't understand that at this point. So this is primarily, chapters 24 and 25, about Israel. It's primarily about the Jewish people. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that the Lord's church can glean from these scriptures because what Jesus has to say to them reveals to us, the church, just how close we are to these events happening in the last days. Now, this chapter will also make it clear that God is not finished with his Jewish people. There's a false teaching that goes around saying that the church has replaced Israel. God is done with the Jews. It's only about the church. 
No, it is about the church, which is made up of Jews and Gentiles, but he will restart the clock with the Jewish people. That 70th week of Daniel, that's when the clock is going to start. That's what we read about in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. It's a final seven-year period when God deals directly with the Jewish people once again. That will be spoken of, we'll see it later on in chapter 24. He refers to that prophecy in Daniel. But for us as believers in Christ today, it's only because we see so many things happening with Israel presently that we believe Jesus is coming back for his bride very soon, his church, you and me. And that's because the 70th week of Daniel cannot happen it cannot begin until the Lord's church is removed and taken up in what we call the rapture. Once we're gone, then and only then will the Antichrist come on the scene. We'll look at that in more detail next week. The signing of this peace treaty between the Antichrist and the Jews, which Daniel refers to, allows them to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount, probably next to the Dome of the Rock, presently there on the Temple Mount today. When that signing of the peace treaty takes place, that's the trigger that starts the 70th week of Daniel, that final seven-year period known as the time of God's wrath. It's also known as, Jeremiah calls it, the time of Jacob's trouble or Israel's trouble. It's also known as the Great Tribulation. So keep these things in mind as we go through this chapter. Again, all these things Jesus teaches are prophetic. And by the way, the best way to prove to unbelievers that God's word is true, it's trustworthy, is through Bible prophecy. In other words, only God's Word, only the Bible from Genesis to Revelation period tells us what's going to happen in the future. And according to God's Word, if you're saying anything in the name of the Lord, if you're speaking forth a prophecy in the name of the Lord, it better come true. If it doesn't come true, they would stone those who claim to be prophets. And so we have God's unadulterated word. We have God's word that demonstrates the truthfulness of who he is. If we stoned false teachers and prophets today, there would be a lot of pile of rocks around this world because there's a lot of people that claim to be speaking in the name of the Lord. Nostradamus, you know, a lot of people like to, oh, Nostradamus said this, you know, whenever it was 500 years ago, you know, he said some things that were true. He said a lot of things that were not true. Joseph Smith claimed to be the first prophet. He's restoring the true Christian church, the head of the Mormon church. He gave over 100 prophecies. Guess how many came true? Less than one. I say that because he had a prophecy about the Civil War. He should have stopped with that about 10, 12 years, or eh, about 30 years before the Civil War. He should have stopped with that, but he said this would be the culmination of all the nations of the world coming together during our Civil War. That would be the end of times. Jesus returned. Well, that didn't happen. So he's a false prophet on every level. The Watchtower Society that oversees the Jehovah's Witnesses, they've given many, many dates over the years. The last one was 1975, saying this is the year Jesus returns. It didn't happen. It's a false prophet. You know, they're full of false prophets, false, you know, prophecies. Only the Word of God can give us 100% truth when it comes to what God reveals. This alone tells us in advance what God will do in the future. One of the great prophets of the Old Testament, Isaiah, was given about 85 prophecies, and every single one of them did come true either in his lifetime or shortly after, or when Jesus came on the scene. Remember Isaiah 7, 14? We quote it every Christmas you know, this will be a sign. The virgin will conceive. She'll bear forth a son. You'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us. We saw that in Matthew 1.23. Uh, Matthew quotes from Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah speaks of all that Jesus would do uh, in, in his earthly ministry. He speaks of his death. Read uh, Isaiah 53. He speaks of his resurrection. He also tells us what's going to happen in the millennial reign of Christ when he comes back. So read chapters 35 and 65. Very important. I mean, what Isaiah said is verifiable, and these things will take place in our near future. Um, 
It's because of God's prophecies that he wants all people to wake up and realize that he is the one true God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the sovereign Lord who holds the entire universe in his hands. Colossians 1.17 says, In him all things consist, or all things are held together in the hand of Jesus. And so he's got it all under control. The Bible's very clear that he created you and me. For a purpose, to know Him, to be in fellowship with Him. The Bible is very clear that God loves everybody in this world. Jesus died for sinners. Are you a sinner? Well, yeah. He died for you. And now you're a sinner that is now a saint who still sins, but He saved you because He loves you. And He loves everybody in this world. He loves you. He wants to save people. He wants to bring them into eternity with Him. And it's only because He's a God of grace and mercy. He alone is the perfect, spotless Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Now look at this verse, uh, excuse me, verse in Isaiah. God tells Isaiah to tell the people of Israel. This is Isaiah 45, starting in verse 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens who is God, who framed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. Now, Jason Lyle, one of the guys that's going to be speaking on a Wednesday night, um, he was at this conference, and he used this verse, and, and what he's quoting is, oh, good, I get to quote that one too. I already had this in my notes. But I wasn't even thinking along these lines. But notice it says, who formed it to be inhabited. And he goes on to this big thing why God spent five days working on this earth. He spent one day creating the entire universe. Spoke it all into existence one day. But five days he spent on this planet. He said, this is the only planet that is inhabited. And he goes into all the UFO stuff and, you know, flat earth stuff and all these type of things. So it's pretty amazing. Anyway, this is what God says. I am the Lord. There is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. God didn't say that. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image. That's where the world is today, just carrying around their little idols. You know, maybe not a carved little idol, but there's so much idolatry in the world around us. Anything you put before the Lord is idolatry. So... They put their, you know, or carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. There's a lot of gods out there, demons. Satan is called the God of this world. They can't save. They lie. God says, tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a, a just God and a Savior, and there is none besides me. Isn't that amazing? But then notice in Isaiah 46, starting in verse 9, God says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. So from the end... He declared what was going to happen in the end from the very beginning. From ancient times past, things that are not yet done, only God can do this, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. So God knows the end, he always has, and he'll bring it all to fruition. In the New Testament, this is what Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 19. So we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So now before we look at Matthew 24 in detail, let me just say what is the next thing that is on the horizon for the church. The next thing that's going to happen is the rapture. No other scriptures need to be fulfilled. No other prophecies need to take place 
The rapture could happen at any moment. 1 Corinthians 15 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed for the better. This mortal will put on immortality. This corrupt body will put on incorruption. We're looking forward to that day. But this is when Jesus comes for his bride. This is when he's coming for you and me. And we are going to be brought up into his presence. How does that happen? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 is how Paul describes it. For, notice, the Lord himself, Jesus himself, he's coming for his bride, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Who are the dead in Christ? Well, those who came to Jesus after Pentecost, who come to Jesus before the rapture, that is the bride of Christ. That's the church. That's the body of Christ. There are a lot of Old Testament saints. There will be tribulation saints, those who get saved during the Great Tribulation, but only from Pentecost to the rapture is the bride of Christ. There's three distinct groups that will be in heaven. We have different roles and responsibilities, but only the bride is made up of those from Pentecost to the rapture. So the dead in Christ, all those who've died over the last 2,000 years in Christ, they'll be raised first. Boom. How long after that? Not long. It's not going to be long when the, we, we get caught up together with them. Look at Then we who are alive and remain, if it happened today, this would refer to you and me, we who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's when they receive their resurrection bodies. That's when we receive our resurrection bodies. We'll be caught up immediately after them. We'll see them. We'll be like, wow, this is amazing. This is the bride of Christ. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. He doesn't come back to earth. That's the second coming. We go up into the clouds to meet him. Thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So we're going to be caught up. The Greek word is harpazo. It means to be snatched away quickly. When people say, well, the rapture, that word's not even in the Bible. That's all right. The word Bible's not even in the Bible. Trinity's not in the Bible. But the concepts are there. Harpazo means to be caught away quickly, instantly, snatched away. Um, the Hebrew, or the Latin was raptus, and that's where we get the English word for rapture. So it doesn't matter what you call it. We're just going to be snatched out of here quickly to be with the Lord in a millisecond of time. Some say you're going to leave your clothes here and it'll be a little pile of, you know, hopefully you're, hopefully you showered. <laughs> Put on clean clothes. Boom, we're out of here, and then we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. Sorry. And again, once Jesus removes his bride, then soon after we're taken out of here, the 70th week of Daniel begins. Again, that seven-year time known as the Great Tribulation, Revelation 6 through 18 describes in great detail. It'll be such a brutal time. This is what Jesus will say. Look at this from Matthew 24, verse 22. Jesus says, and unless those days were shortened, and he just spoke of the great tribulation, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. In other words, God's wrath and his judgment will be so severe, so harsh, that the earth will literally be uh, you know, teetering on the brink of annihilation at that moment before Christ returns. You got God's wrath being poured out for those seven years. The worst is the last three and a half, but it's no picnic the first three and a half years either. And then you've got Satan let loose, unrestrained, deceiving, destroying, demons, you know, going after everybody. And, and then you've got the Battle of Armageddon taking place in the Valley of Megiddo. When we go to Israel, we look over that valley, and it's incredible to think all the armies of the earth are going to be gathered there for this battle. It's going to be crazy. The blood from that battle is his flows for 185, 186 miles through Israel up to the horse's bridle. I mean, it's just incredible how much death and destruction. Right now, we have enough nuclear weapons to blow up this world six times over. A little bit of overkill. And so this world's on the brink of annihilation until Christ returns, and he'll bring it to an end, and then he'll establish his kingdom, and then he's going to turn this world into the Garden of Eden 
kind of condition for a thousand years. That's what we have forward to, you know, look forward to. And only then will this world experience true peace and joy and righteousness on the earth. So that's what the next 1,007 plus years has in store for you and me. But what about now? What do we need to understand about this world before the rapture of the church? Well, well, the Apostle Paul tells us a lot about the last days, the, the, the heart of mankind and all these things. And, you know, they're, they're going to be lovers of themselves, lover of money, you know, despisers of evil or good. And, you know, they will be lovers of hateful things. And, but this is what he says in 2 Timothy 3.13, speaking of the last days, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, it's always bad. Deception is always bad. But in the last days, it's going to ramp up and get worse and worse. It's like, you know, everything's slowly going like this. And then the last days, we're seeing it in our nation. We're seeing it in the world around us today. Isaiah 5, verse 20 speaks loud and clear about the days in which we live today. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Man, when we were in Texas a few weeks back, we saw, you know, all the news about Roe v. Wade and all the protests and stuff. This one lady was holding up this sign, I've had 21 abortions and I'm proud of it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I just grieves your heart. How can you be proud of having 21 abortions? If you hate children that much, go get fixed. You know what I mean? It, it's just ridiculous. Calling evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Again, this is exactly what we are seeing throughout the world, especially in our own country. Lawlessness, immorality, infanticide. So many states trying to get ahead of the Roe v. Wade thing. Oh, we're going to make abortion legal even at birth. I mean, it's just crazy. You know, wickedness, corruption, occult practices are abounding all around us today. But don't be discouraged. It's always darkest before the dawn. And I think the Lord is about to come for us very soon. And then things are going to get even worse. And Jesus will talk about that here in a moment. But never forget, the gospel of Jesus Christ is still the power of God unto salvation to anyone, everyone who will believe Before the rapture, there's still plenty of work for the church to do. Jesus wants us to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaim the gospel, minister to those who are lost and hurting, minister, disciple those around us, come alongside of hurting Christians, pray for them. So much we can be doing for the Lord till he comes for his bride. He doesn't want us just to be sitting here, I think the rapture is going to happen this year and twiddling our thumbs, but he wants us to be about the Father's business until the trumpet sounds. Because it could happen today, it could happen next week, it could happen next year, it could happen 10 years from now. We don't know, but that um, anticipation of seeing him face to face should be a great motivation for all of us today. Finally, before we look at verse one, it's a long intro. Look at what Paul says. This was what he says about the present day in his day, but how much more is this relevant to us today? Romans 13, Paul writes, starting in verse 11, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So I got saved over 44 years ago, November 30th, 1977. Anybody was saved before that? Yes. Anybody saved after that? Okay. Anybody saved in the last 10 years? Wow. Okay. So if you would have come 11 years ago, you'd be toast. Praise the Lord. His, his delay, you might say, is because he's still wanting to use us to bring more people into the kingdom of God. You know, the evil servant says, my Lord delays is coming, but then they get lazy. They don't do anything. They just think, well, I'll just wait around for the rapture. But he wants us to be about the Father's business. So he says, your salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, for the body of believers here and throughout the world, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, 
not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So that's good, important wisdom for all of us today. Until he comes, keep living for Jesus, not for the things of this world. Chapter 24, verse 1. Then Jesus went out of the uh, went out and departed from the temple. So, so he leaves the temple, you know, temple mount, the compound there. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. No doubt the disciples, they're really disturbed by what Jesus has just told them about Jerusalem and its desolation. They're very upset about this. Jerusalem, the temple, is going to be destroyed. That, that is really disturbing to the disciples. In Mark chapter 13, verse 1, it tells us, Then as he went out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. In other words, the disciples are showing Jesus. They're pointing out all the massive buildings to him. Jesus, look at these stones. Look at this building. You know, to them, it was inconceivable that the temple would be leveled, Jerusalem would be destroyed. To them, it like, this doesn't make any sense. Look at this beautiful building. Again, the temple was the most impressive building, one of the great buildings in the world at this time. King Herod had built... The Temple Mount, and those of us who've been there, you can walk along the Western Wall and you go into the rabbinical tunnel and you see these massive stones under King Herod. He started it in 20 BC. Some of these stones are 40 feet long. Okay, one stone, 40 feet long. This stage is like 25. I mean, it's huge. Um, I'm trying to think. This is, how many feet is this? I can't remember, help. Anyway, 40 foot stone, 12 feet high, 12 feet deep. That's one stone. King Herod had these built off site, carved. They bring them on, they drop them in place, do more, bring them on, they get the whole first layer, they put in a bunch of backfill, and then he brings in more. And he keeps doing this. And he got this massive wall, the Western Wall. And it's incredible the engineering that he did. And then he starts building the temple. The temple is still in process when Jesus is on the scene. And in fact, the temple wouldn't be totally finished until 64 AD. It'd be 70, six years later, that it would be totally destroyed. The Jewish historian Josephus said that when the morning sun rose up and it would hit the gold that encased, that overlaid the temple, that you could hardly even look at the, the, the temple. It was so bright, so brilliant from all the gold on it. Amazing. You could see it from miles away. And so to a Jewish person, even the thought of the temple, Jerusalem being destroyed, that's the end of the world. That's it. We're done. I mean, they looked at the temple as the signature of God's blessing upon their lives, upon their nation. And so for Jesus to even hint at its destruction, it's inconceivable to the Jewish people, even to his disciples. And so there's like, look, look at this, Jesus. I mean, this is amazing. Don't you see how glorious these things are? The temple, look at verse 2. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. It's like Jesus is saying to them, oh, yeah, I see it but you guys don't see it. I know what's going to happen. You guys are clueless. All these beautiful buildings, especially the temple, not one stone would be left upon another. You got that slide of the temple, the, the model, the other one? So Jesus is sitting right about here in Mount of Olives. There's, you know, that's the model of the temple. So that's looking from Mount of Olives, looking at the temple mount. You can see people behind it. So some guy, hundreds of thousands of little individually carved stones built this whole replica of King Herod's temple mount. On the upper right is the Antonio Fortress. You can barely see it on the left. You have the Praetorium. I mean, it was amazing. The temple in all of its glory. It actually stood 180 feet high, the Temple Mount. So you can get rid of that. But Jesus, 
says, not one stone would be left upon another stone. He'd already spoken of these things a few days earlier. Remember when he's riding on the donkey, Palm Sunday, he's coming into Jerusalem, and he's on the Mount of Olives, he looks down. Now show that other one of the Temple Mount that you guys took. Um, this is what the view he would have had. The Dome of the Rock obviously wasn't there. That's in the 800s when that was built. But the temple stood right there. And so Jesus sees that, and he's coming on the donkey, and he's overseeing the city. And this is what he says in Luke 19, 41. It says, now as he drew near, you might have to put the words back up, yeah. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. And we saw that Jesus is referring to a specific day, again, a day given by Daniel the prophet. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you and your enemies will build an embankment around you. That's what the Roman soldiers did. Surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. And so Jesus is making a prophecy about what would happen to the temple, the surrounding buildings in the near future. It happened exactly as Jesus said about 37 years later in 70 AD. Well, in 66 AD, the Jews started to revolt against Rome. Rome was overseeing everything. They were the empire, and they were overseeing Israel. And Israel started to rebel in 66. Didn't get very heated up until about 70 AD. The Romans bring in four legions, their top legions, come into uh, Jerusalem, surround the city, they start choking the city out, and it was under General Titus. And they slaughtered over a million Jews in Jerusalem. I mean, it was brutal. Titus had given instructions, do not burn down or destroy the temple. But soldiers who were angry at the Jewish mob because they're in revolt against them, they throw torches into the temple and it catches fire and it begins to get so hot it literally starts to melt the gold and the gold seeping down in all the crevices of the stones of the temple. And so what do the soldiers do when it stopped burning? They started prying each stone off of the other stones to get to the gold. I mean, those temple stones, some of them are pretty good size that built the temple. And they took it stone by stone, got all the gold they could. And you can even see, even to this day, some of the rubble from the temple down below on the temple um, outside the, the walls there in Jerusalem. It's pretty incredible. So that's how this prophecy by Jesus came to pass. Not one stone would be on another. And so as the disciples are saying, do you see these buildings, Lord? He's like, yeah, I see it. But you guys don't see it. So now their minds are really spinning. They're thinking, well, if Jerusalem is leveled, if our temple is destroyed, scraped off the temple mount, that's got to be the end. That must be when Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth. And so these questions are going to be, you know, when does all this happen? So Jesus tells them what's going to happen in the, you know, the near future, 70 AD, but he's also going to tell them what's going to happen in the distant future, to them, he answers one question, but to us, we see, no, he breaks it up into three parts. What's going to happen? Signs of the times in which we live today. Signs of the great tribulation. Signs of when Christ returns at his second coming. He will talk about all those things in the rest of this chapter. So look at verse 3. This is what they ask him. Now, as they, he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, it's in Mark, we, re, we see that it was Peter, James, John, and Andrew that came to him privately with these questions saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So again, these guys are lumping all their questions together because in their minds, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, that means you're, you're coming back at that time, right, Jesus? And so he's going to break these into three different parts. So he answers the first question here, starting in verse 4. We'll look at the other questions as we go through this, Lord willing, next week and the week after. We'll spend some time in Matthew 24. Verse 4 says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed 
that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But, notice, the end is not yet. So something to take note of in dealing with the disciples' immediate future, Jesus tells them to be careful of false teachers, false messiahs, deceitful workers. In fact, Jesus will tell us that this is one of the major signs of the last days, an increase in false teachers, false messiahs, false prophets. And then he's going to warn the Jews during the Great Tribulation, don't believe anyone who says, I'm the Christ. I found the Christ. Jesus says, don't. So every part of this... The first warning is, be careful of false prophets, false Christs, false messiahs. During the Great Tribulation, there'll be those who will rise up who will show great signs and wonders. Jesus calls them, or Paul calls them, lying signs and wonders. No matter where people are within God's calendar, we need to be careful not to fall for deceitful, lying teachers. Again, I'm not the final authority in God's Word. God's Word is. No person has 100% understanding. This is God's infinite Word. Pastor Chuck used to say, God designed His Word so shallow that the baby Christian won't drown in it. But He also created it so deep that the most mature Christian will never reach bottom. That's how amazing God's Word is. And so this is the final authority. In every generation, we must hold fast to the truth of God's word, resist the lies of the enemy, because in every generation, you're going to have these wackos that show up saying, I'm Messiah, I'm Jesus. Remember David Koresh down in Waco, Waco, Texas? You know, he claimed to be Jesus. And a lot of people followed him, followed him to his death. In verse 6, Jesus tells them, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and these disciples certainly did. Rome was constantly putting down uprisings, these rebellions throughout the Roman Empire. But Jesus said, see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. In other words, even as Jerusalem is being leveled, the temple is being torn apart stone by stone, these things must happen. But that's not the end. So he's letting up. That's not the end. You guys might think it's the end right now, but no, that is not the end. He'll give us signs of the last days. We'll look at a couple of them here in verse 7 and 8. For nation, verse 7, will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That didn't happen with the overthrow of Israel. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Again, nation rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. When it came to Jerusalem, it was just an all-out slaughter against the Jews by the Romans. It wasn't nations against nations. Those that survived that destruction were scattered to the ends of the earth. By the way, today is the 55th anniversary of Jerusalem coming back in control of Israel. Remember, it was divided before that. The eastern side belonged to the Jordanians. That's when they won it back in um, 1967. And so they're celebrating that. I was just watching a clip earlier this morning from Amir Sarfati, and you know, a lot of Jews were getting ready to go up on the Temple Mount waving their Jewish flags, Israeli flag. They're all excited. At the same time, (laughs) the Jews, because of all the threats, because if the Jews do this, we're going to come against you, they started flying some of their F-16s over Gaza. Don't take any action right now while we're celebrating on the Temple Mount. The Jews want a temple desperately up there. But again, it won't happen until the Antichrist shows up. Anyway, look at verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows, or literally it's birth pangs. What things are the beginning of birth pangs? Famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. We've had these things throughout the history of the world since the fall of mankind. We've always had 
earthquakes, you know, famines, pestilences. The word pestilence here means viruses, diseases. We've had our share in the last couple of years with that. But by calling these things the beginning of sorrows, literally birth pangs, labor pains, Jesus is saying that the signs of the last days will be an increase in the number of these things and an increase in the intensity and severity of these things as we get closer to the last days. It's just like when a woman goes into labor. The closer she gets to delivery, delivering that baby, the more frequent, the more intense, the more severe the labor pains become. The ultimate fulfillment of these things will happen during the Great Tribulation just before Jesus comes back to deliver the Jews from annihilation. During that time, the seven-year Great Tribulation, worldwide wars are going to be happening. Again, Armageddon. Famines and pestilences are going to be beyond anything this world has ever seen with just two judgments. I think it's the third seal judgment, maybe the fourth third seal judgment, and then one of the bold judgments, just two judgments. Half of the world's population is destroyed. Half of the world's population during the Great Tribulation is destroyed. That is brutal. Revelation also tells us there's going to be three massive earthquakes, so strong it's going to shake the whole world. Isaiah says the world will you know, stumble like a drunk person, just teetering. It also says that the earthquakes will be so severe that mountains will be leveled and many islands are going to be removed. You don't want to be in Hawaii at that time. Believers will be gone. One of the ways we know we're living in the last days, the times of the signs, is because we're seeing increases of earthquakes throughout the world today. You can go on, I googled this, U.S. Geological Survey Department, and it's under the rise of major killer earthquakes. Fun topic. So you, you, it breaks it into 10-year segments. And, and so major killer earthquake. Earthquakes are so severe, somebody died. 1890 to 1899, there was one. 1900 to 1909, there's one. 1910 to 1919, three. 1920, 1929, two. 1930 to 1939, five. 1940 to 1949, four. 1950, 1959, nine. 1960 to 1969, 13. 1970 to 1979, 56. 1980 to 1989, 74. 1990 to 2000, 125. 2001 to 2010, 215. The, the point is earthquakes, famines, pestilences are going to continue, and they're going to get stronger, more intense as we get into the last days. Volcanoes within the Ring of Fire which is pretty much everything on the, the coastlines of the Pacific Ocean. There's, it's called the Ring of Fire because there's so many volcanoes that are active and they're becoming more and more active in these days. So it doesn't, doesn't take a whole lot to set things off. And when they start spewing their smoke and ashes, AOC is going to have zero thing to say about climate control. She can't. There won't be anything for her to do. You know, God is in control of these things. Not peons like us. The tensions of war are getting more and more intense than ever uh, because unlike any other time in human history, we can blow up this world six times over. The Middle East is a, a powder keg. You know, Israel, they're on high alert constantly. You know, it doesn't take much for Ezekiel 38 and 39 to happen where it says God puts a hook in the jaw of Magog, which is Russia, pulls her down into, into Israel. They're, they're coming for the spoils, it says. And all these other countries like Iran, Turkey, and others are lined up with them. They're mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39. They come against Israel, and God's going to wipe them out. That's not even the Great Tribulation. That's just a war probably right before the Great Tribulation, maybe right after the rapture. I don't know. But maybe that'll be what you know, the Antichrist steps up and says, okay, I've got a peace treaty, and here we're going to take control. And then that begins the seven-year of Great Tribulation. Anyway... 
The word nations here, verse 7, it says nation will rise against nation. The word nation is ethnos. It's where we get the word for ethnic you know, groups, ethnic people. So ethnic groups will rise against ethnic groups. Boy, are we ever seeing that on the increase, even in our nation. I mean, everybody's judged by the color of their skin. How sad. It's amazing how bad racial divisions have gotten in our country today. Certain media outlets, certain politicians are cooperating with Satan to increase the tensions of ethnos against ethnos based on the color of people's skin. God hates what Satan is doing, and Satan will pay for eternity what he is doing. The fact of the matter is God loves all people, period. He created Adam and Eve. All families of the earth came through Adam and Eve. I won't read the whole scripture, but in Acts 17, 26, Paul writes, And God has made from one blood every nation, ethnos, of men to dwell on the earth. It's only when we get to you know get saved by Jesus that we realize that person in Africa, that's my brother and sister in Christ, because they're in Christ, I'm in Christ. That person in Northeast India, where we go, they're in Christ, I'm in Christ, that's my brother, that's my sister. China, wherever you go, wherever there's a believer, wherever there's a follower of Jesus, your your brethren, we're brethren, we're brothers, we're sisters. When we get to the book of Revelation, seven times he uses the word. Um, or the phrase, those that hear the gospel, those that receive the gospel, are from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people, ethnos. Where is racism destroyed? In Christ. It's that simple. I mean, when the whole BLM thing started, Black Lives Matter, and I would say, all lives matter. And I had people get on my case, you can't say that. And it's like, what do you mean I can't say that? Yes, black lives matter, blue lives matter, green lives matter. I mean, it doesn't matter. We're all one in Christ. God doesn't see the color of your skin. He looks at your heart. If Jesus is dwelling in you, that's what he cares about. And so it was amazing how many people came against me saying, you can't just say black lives matter. It's like, if they're in Christ, that's my brother. That's my sister. If they're not in Christ, they're still part of the unsaved world that needs to hear about Jesus. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry people cannot comprehend the fact that Galatians 3.28, in Christ there's neither Jew or Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male or female. We're all one in Christ. That's the biblical perspective. The world doesn't like that. The world wants to segregate everybody into little groups and pockets. But Jesus breaks down those barriers. We're seeing signs all around us that the Great Tribulation is just around the corner. We'll look at this in great detail next week, Lord willing. And if that's the case, we know that Jesus is coming for his bride very soon. Because when you see all these signs of the Great Tribulation, that just means we're that much closer to the rapture. Because the rapture is going to happen first. Then God's going to start the time clock with the Jewish people once again. So let me close. Hopefully these will be encouraging words from Jesus as it pertains to these events. Luke 21, verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Amen?